Hi there. I'm Brad Hartley, and welcome once again to Critical Mass TV, a little mixed mental arts for positive change. All the opinions and ideas expressed by me are, are mine alone and don't necessarily reflect the beliefs of the guests or of the station, even though they should. You will see that this is not just another Me Too mess designed to soften you up for the commercials. As a matter of fact, if your favorite shows or the media you read have ads, you better get your skeptometer out and running because those sponsors are the filter that won't allow anything but fluff or open greed cult wealth worship to be presented to you. And I'm just saying. Critical mass, the minimum number of people required to change the world. Let's get it on. Today we have two show segments. The first is Eye on the Greed Cult, the uh, normally live call-in show where almost anything goes. And I promise you on our next live show, it will be a call-in show. We just couldn't get it quite set up this time. And secondly, we have Art Break hosted by Kathy Hartley. The celebration of local artists, musicians, and creative geniuses inspiring us to reach high. So, okay, now let's open the eye. This is Labor Day weekend, 2013. I was wondering, has anyone gotten any invitations to any of the local events celebrating the indispensable contributions made by working people? To the, ind the indispensable contributions to the social political and economic phenom that is Vermont? There has to be some. These should be the most recognized and popular events of the year. I'm just thinking about their importance in resisting the pressure to become wave, wage slave robots that behave well for power. I guess my invitations got lost in the email. Our inability to be proud of ourselves as labor has not always been the case. Labor Day is a United States federal holiday that occurs on the first Monday of September. The intent of the holiday for generations was to celebrate and promote the tremendous social and economic contributions of working people and by association to leverage the political power of labor it has, for several reasons, devolved into a day of barbecues and cookouts marking the end of summer. These gatherings, like concerts, NASCAR races, and football games are fun, but they basically are political masturbation. We've been tricked to assemble without any procreation of power. How can it be, with so many millions of workers, that almost no one sponsors massive rallies or parties promoting the dreams and aspirations of the critical class? Can it be that along with mass hysteria and mass insanity, there exists mass meekness amongst labor enforced by mass manipulation by their leaders? Either Matthew McGuire of the Central Labor Union of New York or Peter J. McGuire of the AF of L, the American Federation of Labor, first proposed the Labor Day holiday in 1882. Oregon made it a holiday on February 21st, 1887. By the time it became a federal holiday in 1894, 30 states were already celebrating Labor Day. Grover Cleveland's signing of the law and acting Labor Day occurred six days after the collapse of the Pullman strike. This infamous strike marked the use of lethal force by the U.S. military and U.S. Marshal Service um, to eliminate striking workers in many U.S. cities. What was the strike about? 
what would cause such volatility and activism within the railroad industry. We will leave a discussion of getting railroaded for another time. Um, but workers and customers of the industry were only too familiar with what getting railroaded meant. Industrialist George Pullman and his workers had constructed thousands of high-end railroad cars that were in use all over the country. In Pullman, Illinois, on the south side of Chicago, George had constructed a large company town that housed thousands of workers and all their families. Uh, these folks were charged rents from their salaries and forced by proximity to buy from the Pullman Company stores. George Pullman rigidly controlled all aspects of life in his community. Along comes the panic of 1893, a big bust in the typical boom and bust cycle of industrial capitalism. The bust became a depression and orders for rail cars plummeted. Because of its nearsighted and top-down structure, similar to today's corporations, the reaction of Pullman mirrors what would happen today. Slashed wages, layoffs, and evictions from the planned community. George uh, did not reduce housing rents or any of the prices in his company's stores that would reflect the lower incomes of his workers, and of course, trouble ensued. On May 11, 1893, 4,000 Pullman workers began a wildcat strike in response to company actions. No one at Pullman had yet organized, and they were approached by Eugene V. Debs, who had initiated the American Railway Union as an organization of non-specialized workers. The ARU organizers um, uh, came to Pullman and signed up many workers and tried to negotiate with Pullman management. The company would not negotiate or recognize the ARU, and the first strike had little effect. To get leverage, the ARU called for a boycott on all trains with Pullman cars and to stop the movement of these trains. The Pullman workers that worked on the trains were not part of the strike. Almost all rail lines west of Detroit were affected, involving 250,000 workers in 27 states. Covering for company management and capitalism generally, the federal government secured a federal court injunction against the union, Eugene Debs, and other ARU leaders to stop interference with all trains carrying U.S. mail cars. The strikers, of course, refused, and President Cleveland ordered the U.S. Army and U.S. Marshals to stop the obstruction of trains. Violence erupted in many cities, and 30 people were killed at the hands of the military. Dozens more were badly injured, and the strike collapsed. Debs was convicted of violating a court order and sentenced to prison. The ARU dissolved, but the resolve of American workers did not. Six days later, Cleveland signed Labor Day into law. To summarize, thousands of people with no meaningful representation in government and no control over the wild fluctuations of capitalist excess act out in the only way available to them in a quest for economic justice. They get no justice, but they do get an unpaid day to remember. Maybe it should be called the Memorial Day for Labor Day, or the Memorial for Labor Day <laughs> would make more sense. Pullman would have liked it. International Workers' Day, or May Day, had been commemorated worldwide for years by the time of the Pullman strike. 
It's interesting that Cleveland wouldn't choose an already established Labor Day for the official date, but the roots of May Day are also homegrown. A peaceful rally was taking place in Haymarket Square, Chicago. The people were listening to speakers in support of workers striking for the eight-hour workday. Police charged in, disrupting the rally in an attempt to disperse the crowd. A dynamite bomb was thrown, and the blast, along with police gunfire, killed and wounded scores of people, including police officers. In the internationally publicized trial that followed, virtually no evidence was presented, yet seven men were sentenced to death and one to 15 years in prison. Four of these men were hanged on November 11, 1887, in Chicago, after one had already committed suicide while in prison to avoid the gallows. Knowing that one hearsay statement had led to these executions, in 1893, the new Illinois governor, John Peter Altgeld, pardoned the remaining defendants and criticized the trial. Labor around the world recognized this event as a rallying point, and huge events occurred on May 1st of each year, and they still do to this day. Cleveland chose the twilight of summer date in an attempt to like disassociate our Labor Day from the surging worldwide popularity of political movements based in labor. This is a simplistic move, but if you look at the techniques still used by big media, where all viewpoints except the corporate capitalist are ignored, one can see it hasn't changed very much. Like I have said, many of these lowest common denominator business requirements are like seventh grade level at best. Big business is always there and to some extent paying attention. For decades after these events, they were replayed all across the country in industry after industry with even the use of mercenaries and hired thugs to beat down the demands for workplace rights. The 20th century was full of uppity people taking their causes to the streets, culminating um, in the 1960s activism that really rocked the corporate boardrooms and their paid politicians. The methods used to con workers are the focus of business and have been amazingly effective. Most people I speak with have a negative view of unions and don't see any benefit to organizing amongst their peers for a better stake. Only about 9% of Americans are organized today and are under constant attack, and most of those are in the public sector. Globalization, or free trade, is the nail in the coffin for many groups. For the greed cult, it is the greatest accomplishment since I don't know what. Not only can a company move its factories to an unregulated, to unregulated developing countries, it cuts the heart out of the local workforce by exposing them to virtual slave labor overseas and the tiny wages that they are paid. Not to mention unsafe factories, corrupt leaders, and contamination of their lands. Uh, one of the biggest destinations for U.S. factories has been China, which, as everyone knows, is a totalitarian communist country. We not only have exported many, many of our manufacturing jobs, um, several million at the last count, maybe more, but we have also borrowed um, many, many billions of dollars from the, their totalitarian communist national bank kind of interesting paradox from the way <clears throat> I was raised and the history I was taught about totalitarian communism. So I wish I had received my invitations to Labor Fest 2013. There could be so much to talk about, 
plan for, and celebrate. I am damn proud to be a working person and not a bit ashamed to say it. We have mentioned in a previous show how one of the important functions of a neoliberal government is to protect markets worldwide at any cost. I forgot to mention that a marketplace of ideas is not included in this equation. It's mind-blowing that even the scattered and piecemeal nature of constructive ideas available to working people is so inflammatory that even the super slick multi-billion dollar corporate indoctrination machine that I call big media isn't completely trusted to keep you hoodwinked. This market will never open. Why is that? The greed cult is disincentivized to behave sanely. The multi-trillion dollar rewards that pile up are based on insane technologies, behaviors, and belief systems. They are not just systemic, they are the system. I've probably said it before, but unlike the wizard's best line in Oz, you, you must pay a lot of attention to the man behind the curtain. Remember that despite these ugly realities, there are many more beautiful miracles, including the fact that any of us exist in the first place. We have not only persevered, but thrived as a species. We are not only adaptable, but collectively brilliant, and we can think our way through coming challenges. I'm sure most people have been to a stadium size event, like a concert, a play, or a sporting event. Have you ever noticed the feeling of collective power, like an emotional wave that hits with a sense that something truly fantastic is happening? These moments are just peekaboos at the potential people have when masked for a reason. The events as they exist are, like I said before, a political masturbation. Nothing will procreate in the power equation that is politics for the attendees, but, oh, the potential. It's up to us. Remember that it is no accident that there isn't a labor section in the New York Times or that there's no mention of the huge political labor movement that shaped the entire U.S. middle class and even allowed for the existence of a middle class in the United States. No mention in middle or high school history, no shows on television, even fictional ones, and certainly no mention made in any form of corporate media. Yay, freedom of the press. Before World War II, the newspaper with the largest circulation in the U.S. was based in labor with a worker's editorial stance. It was called The Daily Worker. Because one narrow viewpoint that unfailingly celebrates wealth and dollars is constantly spoon-fed to us and our kitties, society suffers from battered worker syndrome. It takes outside intervention to stop a batterer. And it has been shown time and again that the battered can rise up and be fulfilled. So please, don't consciously be a right-wing working person. And um, don't take it out on others. <laughs> so I want to share with you an article called Inverting the Economic Order by Wendell Berry, who is a writer and a farmer from Kentucky. My economic point of view is from ground level. It's a point of view sometimes described as agrarian. That means that in ordering the economy of a household or community or nation, I would put nature first the economies of land use second, the manufacturing economy third, and the consumer economy fourth. The first law of such an economy 
would be what the agriculturalist Sir Albert Howard called the law of return. This law requires that what is taken from nature must be given back. The fertility cycle must be maintained in a continuous rotation. An authentic economy, then, would be based upon renewable resources, land, water, ecological health. These resources, if they are to stay renewable in human use, will depend, in turn, upon resources of culture that also must be kept renewable. Accurate local memory, truthful accounting, continuous maintenance, unwastefulness, and a democratic distribution of the now rare practical arts and skills. The primary value in this economy would be the capacity of the natural and cultural systems to renew themselves. The economic virtues thus would be honesty, thrift, care, good work, generosity, and since this is a creaturely and human, not a mechanical economy, imagination, from which we have compassion. The primary value, the primary value and these virtues are essential to what we have been calling sustainability. A properly ordered economy, putting nature first and consumption last, would start with the subsistence or household economy and proceed from that to the economy of markets. It would be the means by which people provide themselves and to others the things necessary to support life, goods coming from nature and human work. It would distinguish between needs and mere wants and it would grant a firm precedence to needs. A proper economy, moreover, would, design, would designate certain things as priceless. This would not be, as now, the pricelessness of things that are extremely rare or expensive, but would refer to things of absolute value, beyond and above any price that could be set upon them by any market. The things of absolute value would be fertile land, clean water, and air, ecological health, and the capacity of nature to renew itself in the economic landscapes. The cultural precedent for this assignment of absolute value that is nearest to us probably is biblical, as in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And Leviticus 25, 23, the land shall not be sold forever. But there are precedents in all societies and traditions that have understood that the land or the world have understood the land or the world as sacred, or speaking practically, as possessing a suprahuman value. The role of pricelessness, the rule of pricelessness, clearly imposes certain limits upon the idea of land ownership. Owners would enjoy certain customary privileges necessarily, as the land would be entrusted to their intelligence and responsibility, but they would be expected to use the land as its servants and on behalf of all the living. The present and now failing economy is just about exactly opposite to the economy I have just described. Over a long time, and by means of a set of handy uh, prevarications, our economy has become an anti-economy, a financial system without a sound economic basis and without economic virtues. It has inverted the economic order that puts nature first. This economy is based upon consumption, which ultimately serves not the ordinary consumers, but a tiny class of, ex of exclusively wealthy people for whose further enrichment the economy is understood by them to exist. For the purpose of their further enrichment, these plutocrats and the great corporations that serve them have controlled the economy by the purchase of political power. The purchased governments do not act in the interest of the governed. They act instead as agents for the corporations. That this economy is, or was, consumption-based is revealed by the remedies now being proposed for its failure. Stimulate, spend, create jobs. What is to be stimulated in spending the government injects into the failing economy money to be spent 
or to be loaned to be spent. If people have money to spend and are eager to spend it, demand for products will increase creating jobs. Industry will meet the demand with more products which will be bought, thus increasing the amount of money in circulation, which will increase demand, which will increase spending, which will increase production, and so on, until the old fantastical economy of limitless economic growth will have recovered. But spending is not an economic virtue. Miserliness is not an economic virtue either, but saving is, not wasting is. To encourage spending with no regard at all to what is being purchased may be pro-finance, but it is anti-economic. Finance, as opposed to economy, is always ready and eager to confuse wants with needs. From a financial point of view, it is good, even patriotic, to buy a new car, whether you need one or not. From an economic point of view, however, it's wrong and unpatriotic to buy anything you don't need. Only in a financial system, an anti-economy, can it seem to make sense to talk about what the economy needs. In an authentic economy, we would ask what the land and what the people need. From an economic point of view, a society in which every school child needs a computer and every 16-year-old needs an automobile and every 18-year-old needs to go to college is already delusional and is well on its way to going broke. In a so-called economy that is dependent on indiscriminate spending, job creation often implies an ability to create new needs. Until lately, this economy has been able to create jobs by creating needs. But this has involved much confusion and a kind of fraud because it gives no priority to the meeting of needs and cannot distinguish needs from wants. Our economy has confused necessities with products or commodities that are merely marketable. What we have been pleased to call our economy does not acknowledge and apparently does not even recognize its continuing absolute dependence on the natural world, on the land economies, and on the work of farmers, ranchers, and foresters, all of which, given the use of available knowledge and precautions, would be self-renewing. At the same time, with a remarkable lack of foresight or even the sight to see what is presently obvious, this economy has made itself absolutely dependent on resources that are either exhaustible by nature or have been made exhaustible by our wastefulness and our refusal to husband and reuse fossil fuels, metals, and other mined materials. By standards that are utterly absurd, it has been too expensive to salvage perfectly good and usable materials from old buildings, which we knock down or blow up and haul to landfills, and, and so make even bricks and stones valueless and irrecoverable. Because of falsely cheap materials and energy, we have a bubble of houses too big to be heated efficiently or cheaply, or even to be paid for. There is no good reason, economic or otherwise, to wish for the recovery and continuation of the economy we have had. There is no reason, really, to expect it to recover and continue, for it has depended too much on fantasy. An economy cannot grow forever on limited resources. Energy and food cannot stay cheap forever, and we cannot continue forever as a tax-dependent people who do not wish to pay taxes Delusion and the future cannot serve forever as collateral. So don't let the hallucinati get you down. We are living a miracle. It's about honesty, integrity, and progress. So off with the heavy and on with the light. Here's Kathy with Art Break on Critical Mass TV. See you, and next time, call me.
Hi, and welcome to Art Break. This show focuses on local artists, creative folks, musicians, writers, photographers, chefs, other creative souls. Today, we have our guests are The Fizz. And we have here Dave Clay, Guy Henderson, and Bob Corti. The, you, there are two other members, the drummer Bob DeFeo and Marshall Breakstone, the bass player, that couldn't make it today. Um, hi, guys. Hi. How Welcome. Are you doing? So your band is called The Fizz. Yes. Uh, and Dave, you're the founder of the band. Yep. The, the original member, getting other members to. Tried, been tried, trying to uh, build what we have right now for ten years, uh, you know, in various forms and whatnot. Uh, and uh, we uh, started out as an original only band. Uh, and, uh, original music? All original music. We played a lot of places uh, playing just original music. A uh, couple of years ago, we decided to try and bring in a little bit of a cover mix into it. Uh, people like to hear the cover song, so we try to work in songs that sound a lot like uh, the cut, the original music that we're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, covers are kind of taken over for now. Covers, they? well, the plan, the, the, the current plan is to, to play about 80% covers and 20% originals. For now. Uh, for now, until we get, you know, we're, this is a fairly new configuration. We've only been together with the, the five of us for about two or three months now. For a little more mass appeal, and then, yeah. and then what you'll be playing your original songs a little bit more eventually. Yeah, we're playing a couple of originals a set, and we're, you know, we, we are, our, you know, our, our goal is to be playing all originals up in, mm -hmm. in front of thousands Your original songs are very of, good. Thousands of people. Right. Your original yeah, songs are very good. Band. That's you right. I love your band. The, <laughs> the club owners are, are mostly wanting to hear the... Um, now, I haven't heard the new configuration of the Fizz, um, so tell me how long you've been um, with the current members? Well, we added the bass player and the drummer about two, three months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a first gig uh, about three weeks ago down at Red Square. Uh, great gig. We had a lot, of, a lot of people show up. Had a really fun time. They hired us back. We're going to be going back there on September 9th at Red Square. Awesome. Seven to ten. And, Monday uh, night. It's a Monday night. It's a Monday <coughs> night. Yep. Red Square is a great venue. Yeah. Well, I love the band, and I love I love your sound. Uh, I love your original lyrics. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. and um, tonight you're going to be playing a couple acoustic songs. Um, yeah, what? we can't we can't do you know we don't have the, the drummer, we don't have the bass player, so right. we, we picked out a couple of original songs that uh, we want to do tonight. Uh, Normally they're a plugged in band. Um, tonight they're not going to be plugged just for the sake of this TV show. Nice. Uh, how many songs have you got in More your in your playlist? More cowbell. More cowbell. Um, you know, we uh, we play about 40, 50 songs. Uh, we've worked in about a dozen original songs to that mix now. Mm -hmm. um, We're adding songs all the time. Uh, adding songs all the time. We just learned One Headlight by the Wallflowers this past week. We're going to play Great that at song. Red Square. Yeah, yeah, some that, Steely Dan, too. Some Steely Dan oh, this past Steely week. Steely Dan. Uh, yeah. Interesting, we like to... Uh, each practice session, we try to introduce new material. You know. So yeah. you're learning more all the time. Yeah, we just picked up Keep a new song. Song. Yeah, a new song that we learned this past uh, couple of weeks from the bass player, an original song from the bass player. Oh, so you're all writers, possibly? He's a great writer right here, mm -hmm. uh, sitting next to me. He, he's written the introduction song for our band. Nice, <laughs> very so, nice. Uh, yeah, we're, it's going to be, a, we're going to start collaborating a lot more, I think. Mm -hmm. an unbelievable talent. Even though band. you've been together, you're still a work in progress, yeah. always growing and learning yeah, like more. Said, we're pretty, pretty much newly formed, so once we start to get to know each other a little better, we'll probably mm -hmm. collaborate more on, on where everyone has an input on it. Right. Song, looking, so looking forward to it. So you're, you're writing more also. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Always writing. Yeah. Always writing, all of you. Okay. Nice. And what about the bass player and the drummer? Do they write also? Yeah. The bass, bass player. player. Bass yeah, player does. does. Yeah, Marshall. He's got some, some Marshall music. Breakstone, he's been in a band called the Melon Heads. Uh, Guy here is in a band called Lamb's Breath, uh, Lamb's right. Bread. Bread. Lamb's uh, Bread, right. Yeah, it, uh, you know, these yeah. are bands that were pretty, pretty popular back in the day, and uh, mm -hmm. we've all, mm -hmm. you know, Bob's from New York City, he's uh, played in many bands down there, he right. relocated up here a few years ago, and right. um, so, you know, we, we have a really uh, great sounding band, and we're doing everything from... Uh, you know, Allman Brothers and uh, Warren Zevon. Warren yeah, Zevon. Good, good loving to short skirt, long jacket. You, you know. guys are very versatile. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> a lot of fun. And, and so do any of you play more than one instrument? Well, yes. yeah. Um, I play the keyboards and the guitars and some maracas and the thing and the cake song that goes... Yeah? Excuse me, I didn't yeah. even spit all over <laughs> you. <laughs> and who else plays more than one more instrument? Cowbell. More cowbell. More cowbell. <laughs> I, I ordinarily play keyboard today. I'm filling in for the rhythm section. He's going to be the rhythm you section. You are the rhythm yeah. section. Yeah. Right, yeah. okay. Tonight, tonight. And Bob plays lead guitar. <laughs> nice. Just spectacularly. Looking forward to hearing it, yeah. Uh, so, you know, when we get going a little bit later, we're going to play a couple songs. Mm -hmm. And those songs are called I Wish I Were, I Wish I Was a Spaceman. Yeah, let me correct your grammar there. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, Wish I Was a Spaceman, it's just a song. That's you wrote? Uh, yes, it's an original song. Both the songs we'll do tonight are original songs. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a song about flying around the room or flying around the bar or flying around the world or the planet, whatever, you know. Right, just it's flying. Flying, just I'm flying high, you know. Wow. Yeah. And where did you get the inspiration for that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't fly too much. Where do you get the inspirations for some of your songs? It's funny. It just hits you. You'd be, you know, the best ones are, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're mowing the lawn, or, uh, <laughs> or if you're, you know, middle of the night and you don't want to get up and write it down. Uh, right. You know, that's what's so nice about smartphones now. Uh, you right. know, if I get something, I'll just throw it into the smartphone on the recorder. Come home later. If it stinks, you know, it doesn't go any it's better further. than waking up in the morning saying, Delty, yeah. What was that genius song I wrote? Sometimes yeah, you know. a, a news item will be a source of inspiration. Right. They can get pretty off the wall sometimes. Mm -hmm. yes, so. Right. Or, or just hearing somebody else's music. Wow, that's a cool groove. And you get it in your head and you go home and you write something along those style, that line, you know, mm -hmm. that, because if, it, if you liked it the first time, you'll like it. Mm -hmm. Differently. And uh, so, where have you played? What play? Mostly in Vermont. We play. Uh, yeah, we have yet to go uh, interstate, uh, with, with mostly Chittenden County area here. And uh, we 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 uh, played up in Franklin County, a couple of places. We played down in uh, you know Addison County, down in Middlebury. Mm -hmm. uh, so wherever so they want to hire us. Wherever right, they want. Right. Right. Just throw the money. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about them. We it's don't care about, about the, the money. Music. Yes. Oh come on! It's all about your your creativity. <laughs> And so you're going to be playing at Red Square on Monday the 9th at 7 p.m. You have to, everyone has to check that out. Got to come. That's, Definitely. That's so piece. you also, um, I don't know if I have them with me, but you had a couple CDs that you um, well, recorded CDs, earlier in, in earlier days of the band. Earlier versions of the band. I mean, at one point we were a drummer, a keyboard player, and me as a guitarist. Mm -hmm. um, right now we have you know, the two, five, piece. five piece, two guitars, two keyboards, drummer and mm -hmm. bass. Um, so those CDs that you know we, we recorded have a couple or three of the songs that we actually do still out uh, uh, mm -hmm. so far. They haven't uh, agreed to do all the rest of them yet. <laughs> right. Do you, are you, so you may be having an upcoming CD? Well, that, that is a, a possibility. A possibility, Let's put it that right. Way. It Once takes, you have a few more songs. It takes a lot of work to uh, put does. an album together. Sure. Um, you know, the, the current plan is to get some gigs. Uh, raise mm -hmm. some money to put a CD together. It ah. takes a lot of money to go into studio and right. do it right. Right. So, uh, you need to get on that Kickstarter thing. Yeah, we could do that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, money, send money. Right. So, uh, and you also have a Facebook page? We have a Facebook page. Please mm -hmm. like us on yes. Facebook. Yeah. And how do we get to that? Just, just, fi just, just Google the, the Fizz. Google the Fizz. Fizz. Yeah. Fizz the band. Right. Yeah. The Fizz. Fizz. This is the Fizz right here. So Google search that and like them on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the Shameless unplugged plug. version. Yes. The, the fizz. fizz. The fizz. Here, here's the telephone number. <laughs> Perfect. All right. That saved me some time. <laughs> okay. So tonight you're going to play two songs. Uh, we already discussed one of them. I wish I was a spaceman. I said that correctly. Yes. And the second one is called A Tribute to Zoot. Tribute to Zoot. And... Um, that reminds me of the man, the wonderful musician, Zoot Wilson. Zoot is, Wilson. is it about him? Or the end zones, Inspired yes. by him? Well, yes, uh, the end zones type of music. That end song zones. was, you were talking about how you, you get an inspiration. That used to be a great band here in the, the Burlington area, the, the end zones, headed by Zoot Wilson. And uh, it's a, you know, their style of music they had, that bluesy kind of thing. Didn't you ask them to play that song? Actually yeah. asked them to play, <coughs> made a little demo. <clears throat> on, a, on, a, on a tape uh, for them. Uh, it never made it to the stage on their stage, <laughs> but it does make it to the stage on ours. Yeah. Uh, actually, he recorded that with... Uh, they were foolish to turn you down. Yeah, that's just right. Fools. Oh. fools. Anyway, it's a song about, uh, you know, that you know, tribute to Zoot. It's, it's nice. called that because 
it's about a guy out there, you know, uh, uh, in a band uh, playing, and he's away from his baby, you know. And right. I, I'm looking forward to hearing stuff. it. I don't think I've heard that one. I'm not sure if I have or not. Um, so these are going to be acoustic uh, versions of the two songs. Um, normally they're plugged in, um, but for the sake of TV, we had to scale things down a little bit. And um, a little bit of a sound check earlier, that will be fine. Yeah. So, uh, are you ready to, to jump into the music? Yeah. Sure. sure. Unless, uh, what, what, let's discuss other things. Do you? Uh, because we're going to be here. Yeah. Well. So, um, is there any other upcoming gigs besides the Red Square? You have. Um, no, we don't have any right now. We're working on. Because you've some played other. a lot <laughs> of places. Yeah. yeah, I've seen you in at least five different places over the years. You guys have been such in Middlebury. Good, yeah, you know, yeah, you guys have been such good fans of ours in the past. Um, you know, coming and to we the will shows. remain good fans. <laughs> As, you know, when we used <laughs> to play all the original music, and, and Brad, you know, love the lyrics and whatnot. That's I really appreciate that. Uh, about a year ago, actually uh, yesterday or two days ago, I had an operation on my shoulder. I uh, fell down and uh, hurt my shoulder and uh, had a, a rotator cuff surgery. So mm -hmm. we had a, I was out of commission for about three months. I couldn't even play the guitar. So we took a little bit of a, a break see. from you know the touring that we were, not touring, but playing around and, and gigs and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Couldn't really gig. Book yep. Um, so we're back on the trail now that we're in the, you know, right. the, the mode that we're in. Right, uh, the right injuries now. definitely will slow you down. Well, I'm, I'm good now, but, yeah. uh, you know, as far as getting more gigs and what we, mm -hmm. you know, we have a lot of uh, irons in the fire right now mm -hmm. trying to get some, some more gigs, but we're just yeah. happy to have gotten these two at Red Square. You have a lot of songs, yeah. so, yeah, so you'll appeal to a lot of different places. Well, I think that, you know, we'll get more... Uh, more exposure and, and more opportunities with after the second gig at Red it's Square. A lot of competition um, out there. There's a lot of bands. There's not a, a lot, lot of bands. bands. Not a lot of places. Really yeah, not a lot, a lot of places to play. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll be happy to get get any gigs we can mm -hmm. in the next few months, and, yeah. and uh, I think people are going to like what they hear when they come to hear us. Oh, definitely. Yeah. The fizz is so. the fizz is definitely a fun. Oh, we band. we were out there, and there was a crowd out on Church Street that had stopped. That was a big, th you know, I I classified as a. Throng. I love I love <laughs> yeah I love Red Square for that. Because you can capture the people just walking by, right? And right. the people sitting there, you know, having their beers and stuff. But yeah, a lot of people can just yeah, walk and by. And the employees and, like this. And, and the, who are, who is yeah. that wonderful band? Why it's the Fizz? Yeah, well, that's it what is the Fizz. You kind of bring it up to the camera. The you Fizz, know? the Fizz. <laughs> yeah. Watch your thing. <laughs> your glasses. All right. Oh, that's all right. Okay. So anyway, we're gonna we're gonna um, get you guys playing a couple songs. Okay. If you're all ready to go, and time -wise. I don't know if this stayed on or not. You're good. It's right. good. Okay. So they're gonna be playing we'll two songs. Uh, the first one is "I Wish I Was a Spaceman." The second one is "Tribute to Zoot." And uh, just gonna take a second to stand up and set up and take it away, guys.
Of all the things that happen. Yeah. That was part of the show. I'm flying high up in the sky, up above the clouds. I'm flying on the ground. Wish I was a spaceman, they get a better view. Wish I was the bass man, or maybe the drummer too. Caveman, ooga ooga, mm, dinosaur stew. Just glad I'm the Dave man standing here in front of you. from the audience there. Thank you. Greatly appreciated. And uh, the next song that we'll do is called uh, Tribute to Zoo. It's a little bit of a rocker. One, two, three, four. I'm in the back of Brattle Bowl. I'm laying down at someone's door. I'm in the back of Brattle Bowl. Laying down at someone's door. I've been down in New York City, I've been here before, I have a pretty little mama, she is so doggone sweet to me, I got a pretty little woman, she is the best to me, she don't like it when I leave her, I don't mind being free. Back to where I came from, gonna take the midnight. Going back to where I came from, gonna take the midnight train. I can't get in no trouble, I can't feel no pain. I'm in the back of Brattle Bow, I'm laying down in someone's door. I'm in the back of Brattle Bow, laying down in someone's door. Up and down New York City, up and 
been here before Now I don't mind leaving it all behind But I sure do miss that girl of mine The Fizz. Thank you. Come see us. Red Square, Monday, September 9th, 7 to 10. Love to see you there. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. That was awesome. Very happy. You just heard, that was the fizz that you just heard. Welcome back to Art Break. I would now like to talk a little bit about the upcoming Art Hop, which is an amazing art show with food, artists, all kinds of sculptures, music. It's on Pine Street and various streets off of Pine Street. It's September 6th, 7th, and 8th, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It's just a crazy, fun, fun experience to go to. Uh, it takes place mostly along Pine Street. It's uh, called the South End Art Hop 2013 this year. Um, it's the 21st annual, and it's put on by SEBA, the South End Arts and Business Association. Uh, there's art, music, activities for children, food, sculpture. Um, there's... Uh, some of the places are the Soda Plant, the Maltex Building, Coney and Brass, the Space Gallery. There's studios tucked in and around all these buildings, behind buildings. There's wonderful music. Um, you just have to go and um, discover all the places. It's part of the fun is just discovering all the different places. There's a great map when you... You can pick these booklets up in Burlington. And, um, or anywhere, actually. They're all over the place, but mostly in the Burlington area. And in, the, and in this brochure, it'll tell you everything. But then there's a wonderful map that uh, tells you, explains where everything is. Um, the food vendors, the artists, the music, when and where. It's very well, a very well done brochure. And then on Sunday is the Art Strut, which is really fun. Uh, it features 20 local clothing designers. Um, they show their creative talents. And it's apparently the largest fashion show in Vermont. Tickets are limited at the gate. And the shows are at 6.30 and 8.30. And they have just the craziest, most beautiful and fun fashions. It's really, really fun. So um, definitely check that out. And uh, if you want to be uh, promoted and featured on my show called Art Break, um, I'm not sure if this mic is on still. I think it is. Um, you can contact me at artbreakvermont at gmail.com. And contact me and tell me what you do if you're an artist, a musician, 
a writer, a photographer, a chef, any kind of creative person. I'm featuring local creative souls. And so thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the show, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.